Amen. Well, my name is Sean Henson, and um, I will be doing uh, Table Talk, Monday Night Table Talk tonight. Just want to thank you. Thank y'all for tuning in, and um, for those of you who do, who do not know, um, I am the assistant pastor of Covenant Life Church, along with my wife, uh, Pastor Andrea Henson, and um, I will be doing table talk tonight. And so, as always, before I start, I always give honor to our leaders, our apostles and our pastors, Apostles Jeff Herbert and Apostles Dr. Linda Herbert. And just an update for those of you who've been praying, she is doing wonderful. She is doing much better. She appreciates all of your prayers. Don't stop the prayers. Continue to pray. And we are all believing God that she will have a complete and total recovery and restoration. And like the Bible says that when the thief steals, he must he must return what he has stolen seven times. And the Bible says he must give all of the substance of his house back. So we are believing for total and complete restoration for Apostle Linda, Dr. Linda Herbert. So continue to pray for her. Continue to to just uh, have her in our prayers. And uh, she will be back shortly uh, to service and will be preaching the gospel. And uh, she will be seven times better, as the word says. And so... As I get started tonight, so I'm going to be talking about adversity, and so um, let's pray first. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for great grace and great mercy, Father God. Father, this is the day you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, Father God. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Father God, with CLC. I thank you, Lord, what you're doing with the Facebook family. Thank you, Lord, what you're doing with our covenant partners and all who are associated with the family of CLC, Father God, I just thank you, Father God. So bless each and every person, Father God, in Jesus' name, Father God. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, Father God, and let us decrease tonight and let your Holy Spirit increase. We stir up the, the apostolic and the prophetic anointing on this service, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. We stir up revelation knowledge, Father God, in this service, Father God. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place, Father God. Have your way in this service, Father God. Speak to us and through us tonight, Father God, in Jesus' name, Father God. Heal, deliver, set free in the name of Jesus, Father God. And we bind any hindering spirits who will try to stop this service from going forth in Jesus' name. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that, that the service will be clear on the airwaves and through Facebook land in the name of Jesus. There will be no glitches and there will be nothing that will stop the uh, word of God from, from going forth in the name of Jesus, Father God. So, Father, we thank you, Father God, and we honor you tonight, Father God. We honor your name, Father God. You have your way, Father God. Let your anointing be on, this, on, on tonight's service, Father God. Destroy every yoke, remove every burden in the name of Jesus, Father God. And I plead the blood of Jesus over this broadcast and over everybody who's watching, Father God. Father God, let the church and let the church hear what the Spirit would have us to hear tonight, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight I'm going to talk about adversity, um, and I think it's important because I think um, what happens is that, you know, the Bible talks about um, having balance. You know, the Bible says that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So when we balance life, that it's, it's on scales, and you want, and you want to have proper balance. And and there are a lot of things in this Bible um, that needs to be put in proper balance. Um, there are people who preach only certain things, but yet they are deficient in other things. But we believe in preaching the whole Bible. Um, there are people who preach health, wealth, and prosperity, which we believe in. But there there are other there are other things, and there are other sides of the Bible that needs to be preached also. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about it tonight is how do we deal with adversity? How do we deal with when uh, trials and tribulations and certain things come our way? And we know that um, we are experiencing that now. Some people have unfortunately experienced um, some adversity through the death of a loved one through COVID. Some people are experiencing um, adversity through uh, financial issues. Some people experience adversity 
just through e uh, trauma or emotional things that um, that are coming out that that sometimes comes our way, and a lot of times um, we have to understand that God is is really uh, looking at us to see how, to, how how do we respond to certain trials and certain tribulations and when adversity comes our way. Because really, if you want to look at it, the true mark of a mature Christian is how do we properly respond to adversity? Do we cave in and quit? Or do we uh, look at it head on with the courage, with the grace, and with the help of the Holy Spirit and his word knowing that we're going to get to it. I mean, with that, that we're going to get through it. Now, you know, the Bible says in uh, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. That's Apostle Jeff's favorite scripture. And if you keep going, Romans 8, 29, it talks about um, that the number one priority as a Christian is for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Um, and so verse 28, all things work together for good, is connected to that verse in 29, meaning that we are being conformed to the image um, of Jesus Christ. That's our number one goal as a Christian, is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so a lot of times what happens is that when trials, when tribulations, when adversity comes our way, um, it is not meant for us to run away and hide. It's not meant for us to just break down and just um, and, and, and just want to just uh, go to an island and, and hide from life. But, but we have to use it as an opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit in us to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's, that's part of what adversity's purpose is. And God allows that to see how we react. And that's, and, and that's the true barometer of how um, God sees us and how much we, we, that we are to grow spiritually is how we handle trials, how we handle tribulations, how we handle adversity. So as we start, um, I'm, I want you to go to uh, Proverbs 24 as I start reading. Um, if you have your iPads or your Bibles or whatever you use, go to Proverbs 24 verse 10, and I'll start reading. Sometimes in life, we go through things that we don't quite understand. Sometimes it's, um, we want to blame the devil, but sometimes it's just life. Sometimes life happens, and sometimes things go on in life that just happens, and a lot of it is the devil, but a lot of it's just life, and God is seeing how do we respond to things that go on as a result of just life happens. Okay, so when things happen, we blame ourselves or other people, the devil, or sometimes, unfortunately, even God. And the truth of the matter is that in this life, there are things that happen. The Bible says, and I'm going to get to the scripture in John 16, 33, but the Bible says, especially those, those of us who are Christians, the Bible says that yes, and all who live godly shall suffer persecution. Okay, meaning that the more godly we live, the more, the closer we get to having that intimate, personal relationship with, with Jesus Christ, persecution will, will follow that. It's not something that we can um, skirt around. It's not something that we can say, well, you know, I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to go through that. No, if, if we want to grow to the full essence or full maturity the way God wants us to grow in him, then persecution is going to follow. And one of the things that happens is that the more mature you get in him, the more that the, your circle of people around you starts to get smaller because the people who do not want to grow, the people who do not want to deal with adversity or trials and tribulations, um, they don't want to have anything to do with people who are growing despite circumstances that are unfavorable or despite uh, trials and tribulation, despite adversity and the people who, who just keep moving forward in their purpose and their calling, 
and despite adversity, despite circumstances, are going to grow. And then the people who just want to quit, the people who just want to throw in the towel, they're going to be the ones that's, that's going to stay at the same level. Or unfortunately, in, or in some circumstances, they regret spiritually. Okay, so, and when you're dealing with the circle of people, you only want to be with people who are going to be able to encourage you during that time, who, who will not judge you, <coughs> excuse me, who will not judge you, but they will encourage you. You know, one of the things that the gift of the prophecy, that gift that is that all of a Christians has, that we all have as Christians, uh, one of the gifts that we all have is the gift of prophecy, and that's to edify, encourage, and comfort. And that's in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, um, verses um, 2, I believe it's 2 and 3. And so you want to, um, when you're going through things or going through adversity, you want to be around people who will edify, that means build up, that mean, and um, encourage, and comfort. You don't want people who want to put you down. You want you don't want people who will say, "Well, I don't believe that's God." You want people who who will be able to go to the throne and pray for you, and the, and it's vice versa. When other people are going through, they want you to do the same thing, and that's a sign of spiritual maturity. How we can lift other uh, other brothers and sisters up in Him, Amen. So, um, if you're in Proverbs 24, and I know you are, so let me. Read this last statement. So we live in a sin-falling world, and just because we are Christians doesn't mean that we are immune to some of the things that happen to us while we are here on this earth. Okay, just because when we got saved, we have to understand that if you're a Christian, when you got saved, the only thing that got saved was your spirit. And all of us, it, we, it is a spirit that we are a three-part being. Now, some of this is just with you to a lot of you, but some of it... You know, you, you'll be surprised how many people don't know this, this basic uh, Christianity one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm just going to do, do this basic Christianity. So we are a spirit. That is our true self. We have a, a soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in this body, okay? And so that's important to know. As a matter of fact, let's go to First Thessalonians, and let me show it to you, the Bible. First Thessalonians 5. 5.23, First Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so again, it talks about whole spirit first, who is our true self, who, who is our real self, our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a body. Now, when we got saved, our spirit became perfect. And one of the things, and that's what salvation really is. Salvation is when our spirit becomes made, becomes made alive. It becomes alive to the things of God. Okay, so it's perfect before God. And our spirit is perfect when we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Our spirit became made alive. Now, our mind, our soul, rather, did not get saved. And that has to be renewed through the word of God daily. And that's Romans 12, 1 through 3. And our body will never get saved. What, what's going to happen to our body is going to go to the ground where it came from. And then when Jesus comes back via the rapture, we're going to have resurrected bodies. Okay? And so, and so that's a whole other message. I don't want to get into it, but... That's who we are, and it's important to know that. And so, Proverbs 24.10 says, If you faint in the day of, of adversity, your strength is small. So let me read that again. It says, If you faint in the day of, of adversity, your strength is small. So he talks about when adversity comes, people who faint, people who cave in and quit, people who just say, well, I don't want to do this. Tomorrow. I don't want to live this Christian life. The Bible says if you faint when adversity comes, you faint when trials and tribulation come, the Bible says your strength is small. And I like this in um, the New American Standard. Let me let me look at that in the, in the New American Standard uh, Bible. And Proverbs 24, 10. 
and it says, Proverbs 24.10 in the New American Standard says, If you show yourself lacking courage on the day of distress, your strength is meager. And so, again, what we have to understand is that, um, you know, the Bible says that, that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. So we have to understand that we, as Christians, we don't go on our own strength, but we go on the strength of Christ because God is inside of us via the Holy Spirit. And so we, we are going on his strength. So he says that when, if you faint, when adversity comes, your strength is small. And meaning that we have, we, we have to understand that that if we cave in and quit, if we say, well, I don't want to deal with this persecution, I don't want to deal with this adversity, I don't want to deal with it, then what are we saying to the God that is in us? We're saying that the God in us cannot handle what, what he allowed to be on us. See, we have to understand the 91st Psalm says, and, and you can read it, it says that, that um, let's go to the 91st Psalm, and, it, and uh, I'm just right now flowing, flowing with the Holy Spirit. Psalm 91, and Psalm 91, and let's deal with verse 15. Psalm 91, 15 says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Verse 16 says, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. But first, verse 15 says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. So know that anything that happens, God is with us because when we got saved, the Holy Spirit became with us. So, and then he says, I will be with him in trouble. See, anything that happens and anything that, that goes on, he said he will be with us. Okay. Then he says, I will deliver him and honor him. Okay, so God is with us. See, sometimes we think, well, where is God in this situation that I'm in? This adversity, this trial and tribulation. Where is God? God says, I'm with you. He says in Matthew 28, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always, even into the end of the world. One of his covenant names is Jehovah Shammah, meaning that he is the he is our present day God. So, and I hope that encourages someone because a lot of times what happens is that when things happen and adversity happens and trials and tribulations happen, well, we're looking around saying, where's God? Well, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere, but he's also inside of us, so he hasn't left us. He is with us during the time of adversity or trouble, just like he's with us when blessings come our way, okay? He's with us when the times of trouble, okay? So we have to really, and, I, and I, I'm hoping that this, this is blessing someone because they... The, you know, people tend to just say, well, I don't know where God is. I don't know why I'm going through this situation. I'm going through this wilderness experience. And, and even in, in the wilderness experience, you determine the, the amount of time you're in the wilderness by your attitude or by our attitude. We determine the amount of time that we are in. A, a lot of us, see, we have to realize that, that just like the Israelites in the Old Testament was in the wilderness for 40 years. Okay, that was a type and shadow of, of the uh, New Testament. And so when we go through our spiritual wilderness, then we determine the, the time and the uh, time that we can be in the wilderness by our attitude. Now, we have a choice. Are we going to mumble and complain? Well, why am I in this wilderness? Are we going to still praise God and still have a positive attitude? If we have the positive attitude and praise God and know that he is with us, then we're not going to spend that much time in the wilderness, okay? And then he's going to give us that rest. He's going to give us that peace. And then we're going to move on to what God has called us to do. Amen? So adversity in the Hebrew is the word sarah. That's T-S-A-R-A-H. And that means a tightness. That means trouble. That means an adversary, that means an affliction, that means anguish, that means distress, tribulation, or trouble. And I want to deal with that, the first word, tightness. Now, what he means by tightness is that 
there are times where we can be in certain situations where it's going to be tight. It's going to be what what he means by um, tightness, meaning that it's, it's, it's like being in um, a place like a um, th those people who who like uh, who are claustrophobic. Let me let me say that. And you are in a place where you, you, you can't you can't breathe. And it's, it's like let me say it's like in an elevator that. That is a whole lot of people, and suddenly it'll it'll break down and stop. And and a lot of people may say, "Well, that's a tight space." Now you're in a tight space, and there's no air. And so basically, that, that's the example that I'm using, and that's what um, type of adversity in the Hebrew means is that how do you respond when you're in that tight space, and and you can't breathe, and, and, and you are in just a tight situation. Sometimes we get in tight situations, okay? It could be a financial issue, tight situation where they may say, well, I'm going to turn your lights off next week if you don't pay this bill, or I'm going to repo your car if you don't pay this, or I'm going to foreclose on your house if you don't pay the mortgage, or it could be a diagnosis at the doctor saying, well, you know, looks like on the x-ray you have this, or it looks like this. That's a tight situation, and, and how do we respond to that? That's what God wants to see. Are we going to respond by just, you know, oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do, or are we going to respond by tapping into our Holy Spirit and tapping into his word and says, okay, what does the word say about the situation? I'm not denying the diagnosis. I'm not denying what you're telling me, but um, I'm also saying that there is an answer in the word of God for that, okay? We're not denying the situation, but if let's say if it's something in our body, we can deny it's right to even be in our body, okay? And we can go to the word of God and say, well, I understand that doctor, that that's what the doctor says, but this is what the word of God says, okay? So that's why it's so important for us to study the word and whatever our situation is and whatever happens, we can go to the word of God and the word of God will, will answer any situation that, 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 well, um, that we are going through and we can go to the word of God and say, this is what the word says. So that's why it's so important to know the word of God. So how we react in the midst of adversity determines our strength level. See, again, determines our strength level is how do we react? We are in this world, but not of this world. Let's go to John 17, John 17. And let's look at something real quick. In John 17, now this is, now I know a lot of people say it's Matthew 6. A lot of people uh, look at that and say, well, that's the Lord's Prayer. But actually, that was a model prayer, and Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. But actually, the real Lord's Prayer is right here in John 17. This is Jesus himself praying to God the Father. And so, there's a lot to the whole chapter, and I encourage you to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to focus on a certain scriptures here. Verse 14 says, I have, I, this is Jesus talking to the Father. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. See, we are not of, when we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are not of the world. What I mean by the world, I mean the world system that if you don't know Jesus, you are under the guise of Satan. Okay, those those people who are not believers, those people who are under the world system under the guise of Satan. So he says that um, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. See, the more we get closer to God, the more we have an intimate relationship with him, the system of the world and the people of that system is going to hate you even more because we are not of them. Okay, and they don't hate you per se, but they hate the God that's in us, the Holy Spirit. And so he says, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Okay, so Jesus was not praying that 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 we should just have a, um, some people call it a spirit of escape, escapism. Well, I just want to get out of here. You know, Jesus, come get us whatever, because I don't want to deal with the world and too many things are happening and bliss and that and trials and tribulations and verses. No, Jesus said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Who's the evil one? The evil one is Satan. Okay. And so what he was saying is that, you know, first John four, four says it, says it best. 
greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So Satan may try his, his tactics and his tricks and everything, but know that the greater one is inside of us. So he, he doesn't need, he, he prayed that he don't take us out, Father, take us out of, out of the world, but he said, keep us from the evil one. And, and how do we do that? Through the word of God. Okay, see, you have to understand that um, the Bible says in Matthew 4, he, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. And so he says in verse 17, he says, um, well, verse 16 says, they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Verse 17 said, sanctify them by your truth, or sanctify means uh, to be set aside them by your truth your word is truth and we know that that jesus is the truth john 14 6 i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh to the father except by him so jesus is the word made flesh in john 1 14 amen and so when we talk about the word of god we know john 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was 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 with god and the word was god and then he goes on in, in John 1, 14 and says that, and the word became flesh, meaning Jesus, as, as only the, the only begotten of the, um, let's, let's go to John 1. Let me look at that real quick to make sure I'm not misquoting that. Yeah, John 1, 14 says, and the word, meaning Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so. Again, um, we're talking about how to deal with adversity. So back to John uh, 17. So in John 17, it says, verse 18 says, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now, why would he send us into a, a world that is wicked and controlled by Satan? Well, very simple. So we can uh, be a light because Jesus said that, when I was here, when Jesus was on the earth, he was the light of the world. But now he's gone on to be with the Father. He's at the right hand of the Father. And now when, when he left, he sent the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit inside of us. And then we became the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so he wants us to be the light and the salt and demonstrate the kingdom to a dark world. And let them know that there is an, another way. And you don't have to be under the guise of Satan, but now you can come under our kingdom and, and have peace and have eternal life. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have to understand that he sent us into the world so we can display the kingdom, so we can reconcile people back to God. Okay, That's why we're here. We're not here to judge the world, to condemn the world. But we're here to show them the kingdom of God, reconcile them back to God, and show them that there is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so he says, verse 19, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Okay. Jesus said that I've sanctified myself. I've set myself aside to be an example to us, the believers. Then he says that I sanctify myself. In other words, he was saying that um, another version says in the New Living Translation says that I and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth, which is in the word of God. OK, and so again, we're talking about adversity. And so the way to deal with adversity is go to the word of God. OK, that's the way to deal with it. And so as I move on. Jesus is saying here that our values and our lifestyle is different from the world system. See, that's that's what holiness really is in its true essence. See, we have a lot of definition of holiness. I'm not going to get into it. That's a whole other message. But holiness in its true setting is meaning that it's a lifestyle that's different from the world system. And our values are different from the world system. See, that's true holiness. It's not a denomination. It's not the way people dress. It's not even the way people shout. Now, I'm not against shouting. I'm not against dancing. I'm for praise and worship and all that. But I'm against the spirit of religion who makes holiness into a, a religion 
instead of what, what holiness really is, which is based on a lifestyle that pleases God. It's based on a different value system. It's based on hearing and applying the word and doing the word um, and, and having a spirit of humility where, um, where that humility, meaning that we are bold enough to do the word in front of the people of the world, of world system. Okay, so that's really um, holiness in its true essence. Now, I'm not going to get, you know, there, there are people who have their own definition of holiness. I don't get into arguments about that. I'm just saying that holiness in its, in its, in its true essence, meaning that it's a value system, it's a lifestyle that pleases God, and that's opposite of the world system. Amen? Um, Hebrews 12, 14, you can look it up. It says, follow peace with all men. Um, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In other words, um, he associated our having peace with all people and determining that, with, which would determine what holiness really represents. Then he says that we have to have peace with people and then, that's, and then holiness being that lifestyle. And then, then if we have that, and if we don't have that, then the Bible says, without, without which no man shall see the Lord. And that means without no man shall see the Lord, meaning that you don't experience his presence here and you won't experience his presence there if you don't live a holy lifestyle that's pleasing to God, okay? And so, and that's a whole other message so I don't want to get into there. So, Jesus guarantees peace during tribulation if we remain focused on him. See, we have to remain, see, another way to get through adversity was remain focused through him. John 16, 33, very familiar scripture. It says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, meaning world system, you will have tribulation or trouble, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So again, Here's Jesus talking about these things I've spoken to you. So in other words, Jesus was saying that I've told you this before. So he's saying that as long as you remain in me, you may have peace. Okay. And that peace, and let's go to what, um, let's go to John 14. John 14. John 14. Verses 27. He says, John 14, 27, he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, okay? So he's saying that if you in me, I'm going to give you that peace, not a worldly peace where where where, where you may people go to worldly um uh, psychiatrists and nothing wrong with psychiatry, nothing wrong with therapy, but Jesus said, I'm going to give you that true peace. Okay. And the true peace is in him. When you abide in him or when you live in him, God will give you that true peace. And that's the way you deal with adversity is that you have that peace. Remember again, Paul said in the Philippians 4, 6, he says, be anxious or don't worry about anything, but in everything with, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, that all your requests be known unto God, and the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 6. But Jesus said that peace I leave with you. So again, um, he was talking about, he was getting ready to go, go away and be with the Father. He was going to be crucified. And then he was saying that I won't leave you comfortless. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And then he said, but I'm going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you confidence. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit comes my peace. So he said, if you remain in me, you're going to have the peace that, 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 that you, um, that what happens is that when you have that peace, that's what you lean on. And that's what you, 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 you draw your strength from is his peace, even in the midst of adversity or trials and tribulations. Amen. So. Even the world or the world system wants to see how we react, how we react, we meaning the body of Christ, react when things don't go our way. Okay, Philippians 2, verses 14 through 15, and this is the New Living Translation. This Philippians 2, verses 14 through 15 in the New Living Translation says it this way. It says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean 
innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So he starts off, Paul was talking, he was saying, do everything without complaining and arguing. So what happens a lot of times when adversity comes is the first thing we want to do is complain and argue. Okay, Paul is saying, do everything without complaining and arguing. Now, how will how do we do things without complaining and arguing when adversity comes? Praise. Instead of complaining and arguing, we praise. See, you cannot praise God and complain and argue at the same time. Okay, those two don't mix. See, either you're going to praise God in the midst of adversity or trial and tribulations, or you're going to complain and argue. Okay, and and um, how do we do that? Well, Psalms 34. Psalms 34. Let's look at it. Very familiar scripture. Psalms 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. Good times, bad times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Verse 2. My soul shall make his boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Verse 3, O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. So again, how do you how do you deal with adversity? You don't you and and um when that spirit tries to come on you to complain and argue when adversity comes, you praise God. Because that's the real true test of a spiritual Christian, of a spiritual Christian that, 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 is, that is maturing in him, is what happens when adversity comes, well, you praise him. You praise him for just waking up. You praise him for having a job. It may not be the job that you want. You may not be making the money that you want, but thank God you have a job. Thank God that he woke you up. It wasn't an alarm clock. Thank God that you have food on your table. Thank God that you have a house. You have a, a, a place to sleep and lay your head. You could be homeless. So see, and see, you can make a list of everything that, um, that, that you can praise and thank God for. Okay? Thank God you have strength. Thank God that you have your, your health. Thank God you have a sound mind. So you could be in a psychiatric ward. See, again... Um, there's so many things that we can praise and thank God for instead of complaining and arguing. Amen. And so he says, do everything without complaining and arguing so no, so that no one can criticize you. Meaning that people are watching our walk, especially the word, especially the world. The people who are not believers are watching the way we walk. And so they do it because they can't help it. But if we do it, they're saying, well, I thought they were supposed to be Christians. And so we have to be the example to them and say when, when stuff comes our way, adversity comes our way, instead of complaining and arguing, then we're going to just draw that peace and we're going to praise God, the peace of God, what I just talked about. John 14, 27, Philippians 4, 6, Isaiah 26, uh, 2, where it says that, um, where it talks about he will keep me in perfect peace as my mind is stayed on him because I trust in him. See, we have to draw on the word of God and draw on his peace instead of complaining and arguing. Amen. And so he says, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Live clean, live holy. Okay. I just talked about um, holiness and live clean, innocent lives. So once we live clean, innocent lives in front of the world, they're going to see that we are different. And there's something in us that's going to draw them to us saying that, what is it that 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 causes you to have peace? Because sometimes they even know what we're going through, but they're going to. But as long as we draw on the peace of God, they're going to come and say, well, I need to know that God that you serve because I'm going through all types of stuff and I don't know what to do. And then that's when we can do do the work of the evangelist, as first Timothy, um, I think, four or five says. And then that's when we can. Um, explain to them that that the peace of God and that Jesus will give you that peace. He will give you eternal life, but he also will give you peace in the midst of what you're going through. And then that's when we turn into an evangelist and get them saved and then disciple them and then they can go and then um, share the same gospel with others. And see, that's part of 
demonstrating and activating the kingdom of God. Amen. And we know the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So we cannot be people who pray and encourage others during their trials, but faint and give up when it comes our way. Let's go, let's go to Job chapter four. A lot of people try to avoid Job, but Job had some powerful truths. And this is Job chapter four. And uh, we decided the New Living Translation. Job chapter four. And this is um, after, you know, and y'all know the story of Job and how God allowed the enemy to take his family and take possessions and cause him to go through the physical ailments and everything. So this is after um, in chapter three when he was... Um, complaining really to God and saying, well, why are you allowing this to happen, God, and all this? And so his friends were there. He had three friends that, that was there constantly with him, listening him, and this is their response to what Job was talking about in chapter three. So Job four, verse one says, then Eliphaz the Temanite replied to Job, will you be patient and let me say a word? So, in other, so when you complain and argue, you know, you're not giving anybody a chance to respond or a chance to pray and encourage you and give you something from the Holy Spirit to encourage you. You just complain and say, oh God, I don't know why this happened. I don't know why this is this and that. And you just complain and argue. So Eliphaz is saying, will you be patient and let me say a word? For who could keep from speaking out? In the past, verse three, you have encouraged many people. You have strengthened those who were weak. Your words have supported those who were falling. You encouraged those with shaky knees. But now, when trouble strikes, you lose heart. You are terrified when it touches you. Doesn't your reference for God give you confidence? Doesn't your life of integrity give you hope? Stop and think. Do the innocent die? When have the upright been destroyed? My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. A breath from God destroys them. They vanish in a blast of his anger. So in other words, he was saying, Job, you have to draw on your experience before all this happens. And, and you, we know that you live a life of integrity. We know that you are a man of God. We know that what happens that you encourage others when adversity and stuff happen to them. So you have to, what, what basically what he was saying is, Job, you need to practice what you preach. The same way that you encourage others is the same way you have to allow us to encourage you. And sometimes when, when adversity and stuff happens to us, we have to allow people to pray for us and encourage us and practice what we preach because the same way people would, um, uh, would want us to encourage them and strengthen them and pray for them and give them a word, a prophecy, a word from the Holy Spirit is the same way we, we should, we should um, allow people to, to give us a word of encouragement, okay? And so that's what he was saying. He was saying that when things happen, he, he was saying that, that, that you encourage others and you cause others when people were going through not to lose heart. But now when it comes on you, now you are saying that you want to give up. And so we have to be careful to, we have to practice what we preach, especially as leaders and especially as ministers of the new covenant. Amen. So I encourage you to read Job, um, the whole, whole book of Job. It will bless you. Amen. And so the ministry of grace gives us the ability to not give up. And this is 2 Corinthians, and this is um, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 through 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so what he was saying is that because we under the new covenant, and we are not under the law of Moses. He was, this was Paul comparing what we have now under the new covenant as opposed to what happened to people um, under the law of Moses. See, under the law of Moses and in the old covenant, they didn't have the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Holy Spirit will come upon people, but it wouldn't come inside of people. And they had to, um, of course, you know, you know, you can read it, but... Uh, he was talking about how Moses 
would go up and be in the presence of the Lord and there was uh, a shine and a glow that um, he had to put a veil over his face because the people couldn't take the fact that he was in the presence of the God of, of the Lord and the presence of God um, or Moses would, would, would put this uh, glow on his face that people couldn't take. But that was under the old covenant. But now when Jesus died, it was resurrected. The Bible says that the veil of the temple was rent or was torn in two. And now we're under the new covenant. And so he was saying that because the spirit of the Lord, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, wherever we go, we have freedom now. We have freedom. And the freedom from what? Freedom from uh, condemnation. Uh, Romans 8, 1 says, there is now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus. Freedom from the old bondage that was under the uh, old covenant and freedom from... Um, freedom from the law, basically the law of Moses. And so wherever we go, we take that, we, we take the spirit of God with us and we take that freedom. He was saying that, that, um, and then we, when we allow the Holy Spirit through the word of God to transform us into his image, like I talked about in Romans 8, 29, and it's a constant transformation from the same members from glory to glory that were um, transformed. It's like it, it uh, literally means um, the, the Greek there is metamorphosis. It's like how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. And so that's what he's saying. As we allow um, through the word of God, the Holy Spirit to transform us, then we go from glory to glory. And the Bible says that he transform of us, he, he transform us through the word of God into his image by the spirit, the Holy Spirit that, that is within us. And then he says, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 1, he says, therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. In other words, because now we are under the new covenant and we are ministers of the new covenant, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, then when adversity comes or trouble comes, we don't lose heart. We don't give up because we have the Holy Spirit in us to lead and guide us into all truth. And so we don't give up. Okay, we have a ministry now. All of us are ministers. One of our sayings, and those of you at CLC know this, he says that every saint of minister um, talks about, well, that, that's our slogan. He says, every saint of minister walking in their destiny. So, and it's the same. When you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a minister. So many people believe that, um, well, I'm not a minister because I'm not on a pulpit. Well, you carry your pulpit everywhere you go. That's, that's why it's called marketplace ministry. So wherever you go, you are a minister. And you can read that in 2 Corinthians um, 3. And uh, you, can, you can read that. I don't have time to get into that. But it talks about we are all ministers of the new covenant. And it talks about how um, that, um, and you can read um, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, where, where it talks about he has given us all the ministry of reconciliation, meaning that he has given us all the ministry to get people saved and reconcile people back to God. And you cannot have a ministry without being a minister. So that's why when we confess Jesus as your Lord, as, as, when you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now you become a minister, minister of the gospel, okay, to activate and the kingdom of God into this dark world. Amen? Okay, so let me go on because time is is going. So we must look at this life through the eyes of faith. And we know faith is believing and acting on the word of God. Okay. It's having the conviction and and it's believing the word of God. That's in the simplest terms about faith. And we know that the word says Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith is it possible to please God. For first, we must believe that he exists and he's a rewarder to them who diligently seek him. So we have to understand that faith is the currency of the kingdom. Amen. And so and so uh, we, we must look at this life through the eyes of faith. And 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 16, 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 16 says, for all things for your for all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So he was saying that, Paul was saying this, Paul was saying that no matter what we're going through, grace will get us through. 
and we know grace is unmerited favor, and we know that, that, that grace gets us through everything. We know that we are saved by grace. The Bible says that uh, for by grace we are saved through faith. And so everything revolves around the grace of God, amen, through faith. And so he's saying that for all things and for, for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. In other words, he was saying that because we rely on the grace of God, it's going to cause uh, a blessings for you and it's going to cause people to get saved because we are walking by, our, by the grace of God, even though we're going through trials and tribulations, Paul was saying, and adversity is causing that adversity and that trial and tribulation is causing blessings to the people and then causing people to come to Christ. So Paul was saying that I don't mind going through this adversity as long as it's resulting in people getting saved, it's resulting into the people getting blessed. And he goes on to says that it also resulting in God being glorified. So, I, so ultimately, the adversity, if we go through it the right way with the right attitude and motive, it's going to cause people to be saved. It's going to cause other people to be blessed, and it's going to be called, and it's going to cause God to be glorified through in the midst of what we're going through. So, therefore, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So, we have to understand that even though our outward man, our physical bodies are perishing, dying every day, our inward man, meaning our spirit, is being renewed day by day. And how, how, how do we um, allow our inward man to be renewed day by day through the word of God? Amen. So sometimes God allows us to go through tribulation so other people can be blessed. I just read how Paul said it in 2 Corinthians. And so in... Um, Ephesians 3, verses 12 through 13 in the New Living Translation, he says that because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Okay, so Ephesians 3, 12 through 13 says, so please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. And so what he was saying is that again, he was saying, don't feel sorry for me because of what we're going through. And we should not feel sorry for people. He was saying, why? Because if you suffer right, if you suffer the godly way, it's going to cause glory to God. And God's going to get the glory out of your life if you go through the adversity correctly with the right attitude. He says that don't, don't feel sorry for me. Don't lose heart because of my trials. He says that I'm suffering for you so God can get the glory and you can be blessed. And you can know how to deal with it because I'm giving you an example through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus of how to go through it successfully. So you can understand and teach people, teach people when they go through it, how to go through it successfully. And then God will get the glory. Amen. And so we, we can't give up just because the Lord is trying to correct something in our character. See, sometimes adversity comes because he's trying, he allows adversity because he's trying to correct something in our character. All of us have issues. None of us are perfect. All of us, myself included, all of us are not perfect. Sometimes we, we have, adversity comes, God allows it to correct something in our character. And he will show that through, uh, through adversity, through trials and, and, and tribulation. In um, Hebrews 12, verses 4 through 6, it says, After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And so what he was saying is that we are not Jesus. Jesus. Jesus was on the cross, and Jesus took our sin, and he shed blood for our sin. See, there was a great exchange when Jesus was on the cross. See, um, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, I believe it's 21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the great exchange was is that Jesus uh, took our sins and then in exchange, he gave us his gift of righteousness so that we can live in uh, eternal life, so we can have eternal life in him. And he gave us his righteousness so we can live holy um, holy in the midst of a dark world that we can live holy and and we can be perfect and just in the sight of God. See, we are not perfect in our own self, but we are perfect and righteous be in, in the sight of God because of who Jesus did and because of what Jesus did. His finished works on the cross 
made us righteous and made us perfect in um in the sight of him. See, I'm righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus, not in my own righteousness because of the righteousness of Jesus. I'm perfect because of the perfection of Jesus. Amen. And so Hebrews 12, he says that, and you have, he says, after all, you have not yet given your lives and your struggle against sin. See, none of us have given our lives the way Jesus did. Okay. Jesus, the Bible talks about how, how God, how, how Jesus was on the cross and he died for all of us and for all of our sins. That's why even John said in John 1, it says, behold, the lamb who, who, who takes away the sin, singular, of the world. Okay. So he says, and have you forgotten? And after all, you have not given your lives and your struggle with sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? This is Hebrews 12, 4 through 6, the New Living Translation. He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord um, disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. So again, what, what he was saying is that sometimes God has to come and he has to correct us. He has to, he has to discipline us. And that is to sometimes correct our character, to put us back on the right track. And sometimes he will allow adversity and trials to come. And so he'll be able, so we can, um, so we can just seek his face and say, okay, God, what are you trying to correct in my character so I can get back on the right path? And so, so I can know what to do because of this adversity hits us. So he corrects us, but he corrects us as a loving father. See, we have to understand that, that a lot of people, they see God as this angry, vengeful father of the whole covenant. No, he's not. Okay, he is, he sees us differently. Now, the Bible does say in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus is the same today. Um, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But at the same time, because of the new covenant that we live in, we're not living under the law of Moses. We live under the new covenant. He sees us differently. He sees us through the eyes of Jesus and the finished works of Jesus. So, Jesus, the Bible talks about in Isaiah that God is not angry with us anymore. I don't have time to go through that, but God is not angry with us anymore. And so when he uh, corrects us, uh, he corrects us as a loving father, not as this angry, vengeful God that religion has trying to tell us of who he is. You know, there are people who say, well, you know, if you sin, you're going straight to hell because God, God don't like ugly and God don't like sin and 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 um, you going straight to hell. No, that's not biblical. See, see, the Bible says the people who are going to hell is the people who reject Jesus and His grace and reject Jesus and the finished works. See, those are the people that's going to hell. See, Jesus, God sent Jesus. Jesus took care of the sin problem. Okay. So understand that God, um, God is not an angry, vengeful God, but he's a loving God. Now he will use adversity. He will use certain things to correct us, correct our character, but he still loves us. He loves us unconditionally. Amen. And so I'm going to end here this last scripture. I'm getting the, the nod here. I need to um, end. And it's Galatians 6, 9. We must always remember, Galatians 6, 9 and NIV says, we must always remember that if we are doing good for Christ, the harvest will come at the proper time. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen. So, I see we don't, so I see that we don't have, do we have any um, prof, uh, prophecies for people that I can pray for? I don't see any on the phone. So uh, I don't know if Jam, are you sending that to Andrea? So please let me know if there's any uh, prayer requests, any prophetic words that I need to give. Okay. I don't see any on my phone. Let's see. Okay. Now I see some. Okay. Prophecies. We have two prophecies here. Okay. And this is, and please forgive me. I, I cannot pronounce this Okay, okay, so this is, I'm going to, you're going to have to forgive me, so I can't, this, this is Tumwajuka Simon, 
is the first prophetic word, okay? So I'm going to stop uh, prophesying over to Majuka Simon. Please forgive me if I if I mispronounce your name, please. Okay, I'm going to start uh, prophesying over, over him. So bear with me one second. Amen. Father, we just pray for um, to Mazuka Simon in Jesus' name, Father God. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father God, I thank you, Lord, for, for this powerful uh, man of God, this, this powerful um, warrior of God. And I'm hearing God says that, that you are somebody who, who has pressed in to seek me and who has pressed into my word and someone who is grounded in the word. And God says that that you are somebody that I'm going to use in these last days to mentor, to mentor young people and also to just teach. There's a ministry calling on your life, God says, to teach the word and to disciple even young people. And God says that he's put that inside of you and he puts that 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 ministry calling inside of you. And that's something that, that you have known for a long time. And God says that that sometimes that there was um uh, there were doors of opportunities that were closed. God says that he's opening those doors now. And God says that you have a marketplace ministry. And God says that there is, um, even there is an entrepreneurial spirit on you that, that God is putting inside your spirit for, for, for you, for God to be glorified, um, even in the finances. So God says that he has put a lot of gifts inside of you and he's put a lot of of things that um, he wants to use you in this in these last days, and God says that that he's opening doors of opportunity. God says that even there's been some at uh, the waves of adversity have come, and even the enemy has tried to get you to quit. And God saying that that um, I that that you have stood the test, and you have even faced those adversities head on. And God says he's pleased with that. And God says that. He's even healing you of some things of the past that the enemy's tried to bring up. Some um, even e even how how the enemy tries to put uh, mind uh, binding spirits on you. So we bind any mind binding spirits. We bind any things of the past that the enemy's trying to bring up to try to take you off course. To try to take you away from the purpose and calling that um, that God has for you. We thank you, Father God, that he that that um, he is using you to press forward and to activate your kingdom here on the earth. I thank you, Lord, that there's a mentoring, anointing on your life to mentor people, mentor young people, and there's a teaching anointing. There's a teaching gift on you also. So, God, we thank you, Lord, for my brother. We thank you, Father God, for what you're doing in his life. And, 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 and as he seeks you, Father God, and as he um, delights, delights himself in you, you said that you will give him the desires of his heart. So we thank you, Father God. For my brother, we thank you for what you're doing in his life. We thank you for the ministry calling and the gifts that is inside of him. In Jesus' name, I'm hearing God says that make sure that you get into a ministry, make sure you get into a church that, that can teach you how to activate and cultivate those gifts that's inside of you. So we just charge that to my brother in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So. And the next. And the next prophecy is for Monisha. Again, please forgive me for pronunciation. Pagina. Monisha Pagina. Please forgive me if, if I mispronounce your name. Please forgive me. And so this prophetic word is for Monisha Pajima. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Monisha. We thank you, Lord, for my sister in Jesus' name. Mary and God says that Monisha, that he's so pleased with you. And he's, I'm hearing God says that he loves you with an everlasting love. And I'm hearing God says, Monisha, there have been people who have tried to tell you that, um, that, that tried to say that you are strained for walking in your purpose. Um, they're trying, there were people who try to block you from um, doing what I've called you to do. And because I'm hearing God says that he's uh, given you through his spirit uh, uh, some 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 great um, purpose, and and, and and he's given you a great calling, and God says that that you are one who 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 has not given up. You are one who who has gone through 
doors where um, where the enemy has blocked and where people say that you couldn't go through. And God says that that you are one who, who will kick the door down even when the enemy tries to block it. And God says that I have given you confidence. I've given you boldness. So God says continue to keep going. Continue to do what I've called you to do. Continue to seek me because God says that he's given you revelation knowledge and he's stirring up the gifts and He, you have... Uh, a, a prophetic calling on your life and you know how to pray you're also an intercessor god says and god says that continue to pray continue to intercede because you intercede for your family you even intercede for nations god said so god says continue to pray for nations continue to intercede on behalf of your family god says that he has your family in the palm of his hand god says that he will continue to give you assignments to pray for nations assignments to pray for 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 different people even presidents i'm hearing and even uh um just influential uh people all over the world presidents and prime ministers god says that he's going to use you to intercede for them and even in the future even to be able to pray for them personally because god says that that's one of the gifts that he's put in you you have the, the uh the ministry of, of the intercessor inside of you and you have that prophetic gift and even a healing ministry i'm hearing that, that, that God says that inside of you also. So I just thank you, Lord, for my sister. I thank you, Lord, for the gifts and calling that you have put inside of her, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that she is, I'm hearing that, that your scripture is um, um, in 1 Corinthians where, where it says, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the, God, of the Lord, because your work in the Lord is not in vain. So God says, just continue to just be a be be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God says, always, always abound in the work of the Lord. God says, so that's your scripture. I think it's First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight, um, and that scripture is your portion. So we seal that to my sister this day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And so this is a prayer request from um, ladies from, I think this is Lydia, Lydia Kayes for her mom, Shelly, as she prepares to travel internationally for work with, um, overseas, healing and deliverance. Father, I thank you for, um, I believe that's Lydia Chaos. Please forgive me if I don't. If I don't pronounce his name. So, Father, we pray for her mom, Shelly, as she prepares to travel internationally, Father God. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Father God, for her ministry, her marketplace ministry, as she prepares to go overseas, Father God, in Jesus' name. Father God, we decree and declare Psalm 91 over her right now. No evil shall befall her. Neither shall be plague, sickness, disease, COVID-19, uh, Delta variant, or even a breakthrough case will come down her dwelling, Father God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Time out. I didn't put the uh, prophetic word on. Hold on. We want. Okay. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, Lydia's mom, Shelly. So, Father, we thank you, Father God, as she prepares to travel internationally, Father God. We decree and declare Psalm 91 over her right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. We decree Psalm 91 over her right now. No evil shall befall her, and there's any plague, sickness, disease, or infirmity. Come down her dwelling in Jesus' name. No COVID-19, no breakthrough case, no Delta variant, Father God. So, Father, keep her safe. We ask that you dispatch holy angels to protect her, Father, in Jesus' name, Father God. We thank you for even um, giving her the activating the gifts as she travels, Father God, as she ministers. Um, to different people and and activate her gifts, give her the uh, prophetic words that she will uh, be able to edify and encourage and comfort people in Jesus' name, Father God. Prosper her business, prosper everything that you're doing in her life. We thank you, Lord, that she will walk in the blessing, Father God. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and has no sorrow to it. So we thank you, Lord, that there will be no sorrow to the blessing that she will walk in, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that you are uh, ordering her steps, Father God. We thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name, Father God, that um, that, that that you will give her wisdom as, as, as when it comes to her business and when it comes to ministering to others, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for it right now in Jesus' name, Father God, that she will have safe travels. 
in Jesus' name, Father God. And we thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that as, as she goes and travels internationally, Father God, that she will keep her mind stayed on you, Father God, that she will continue to seek you and seek your word, Father God, for guidance and wisdom in Jesus' name. And we just thank you, Father God, for what you're doing with, with, with her, Shelly, with Lydia's mom right now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... And the next one is, again, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing these. Um, this is Karen Van Jukeningswich. Jukeningswich. Please forgive me if I don't. And, and she wants prayer for her daughter and her husband's marriage. Okay. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, um, for my sister Karen. And we thank you, Father God, for her daughter and her husband's marriage in Jesus' name, Father God. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, well, stop. So, let me put the, okay. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Karen's daughter and husband's marriage in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus that, that, that we pray for their marriage. We thank you, Lord, for unity in their marriage in Jesus' name. We thank you that your word says, how can two walk together unless they are in agreement? So we thank you for a spirit of agreement in Jesus' name. We just bind and come against the spirit of confusion right now in their marriage in Jesus' name, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that your word says a threefold cord will not, shall not be easily broken. So we thank you, Father God, for that threefold cord in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father God, as they seek you and your wisdom, Father God, as they seek even godly counsel, Father God, that they will grow closer to you as well as each other, Father God, in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father God, that they have a ministry calling, Father God, in Jesus' name. So we call forth the calling and the ministry calling that you have for them and the purpose and calling in their life, Father God. And we thank you, Father God, for their marriage, Father God, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, for um, for, for just having godly conversations. And, and we thank you, Father God, that they will pray together, Father God, as one. The Bible talks about... Um, that what God has joined together, that let no man put asunder. We thank you, Lord, that the two shall become one. So we thank you, Father God, that they are one in your sight, Father God. So we thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name, Father God, for, for just bringing them back together in unity. And we thank you, Lord, for a spirit of agreement, Father God. Keep them safe in Jesus' name, Father God. We thank you for the, for, for, for the ministry gifts that's inside of them. That We thank you, Father God, that you are activated in them, Father God. In Jesus' name, Father God, and we come against any strife. We bind the spirit of strife. We bind the spirit of division right now in Jesus' name, and we lose love. We lose the peace that surpasses all understanding. We lose joy. The joy of the Lord is their strength in Jesus' name, Father God. So we just thank you, Lord, for them right now, and we thank you, Lord, for restoration. We, I decree and declare a spirit of restoration in their marriage right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. Restore Restore what, what the enemy has tried to take away, Father God, in Jesus' name. So I thank you, Lord, for a spirit of restoration right now in the marriage, right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it, and we charge that to, to them right now. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I want to say, I uh, believe that is it. Um, I believe that's it, Jam, um, for all the prophecies and the prayer requests. And if, forgive me if I miss anyone. So I'm just going to go right into the announcements. There will be no service November 12th. Um, that's this Friday because of the Veterans Day holiday. And also um, on that Sunday, which will is the 14th, there is no prophetic class because of the holiday. And also on the 15th of November, there is no Monday night table talk. So please, um, please note that there is no service on Friday because of um, this Friday because of the Veterans Holiday, Veterans Day holiday. And there is no prophetic class on Sunday. We do still have service, regular service. 2.30 on Sunday, but we just don't have the prophetic class that precedes our regular service um, at 2.30. And also, there is no Monday night uh, table talk on the 11.15 um, on next Monday night. 
Also, the food drive that we're doing continuing until November the uh, 14th. Um, so, uh, can you hold on one second? Hello? Hello? Okay. Sorry, just was, that, that was my wife calling, so. Okay, so there, there is a food drive until um, November 14th. Um, still going on until November 14th. The senior ministry uh, has a Christ Christmas fellowship, the White Elephant Gift, Gift Exchange, and that's Saturday, December 11th, 2 through, 2 through 4 p.m. And so that's the senior ministry around there, Christmas fellowship, um, the White Elephant Gift Exchange, Saturday, December 11th, from 2 to 4 p.m. And I believe Elder is heading that up. So, and also the CLC family, Home for Christmas, it will be on 12 19 21. More information forthcoming. And also the Singles Evangelism Bonfire, is it confirmed yet? Uh, is, is it confirmed as of yet? But we will let you know the date as soon as we get it. So, those are the um, announcements. Also, tomorrow, don't forget, we still have prayer. Um, tomorrow night at 7.30, and I think Jam is doing the um, announcements to that. So um, please uh, look at the website. Please avail yourself to the website, and Jam is doing the... Um, Jam is going to put that in the comments, I believe. Um, so we still have the prayer on Tuesday night, and she will give you the, uh, I believe, the conference call number for that. And I believe that is it for the announcements. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word tonight, Father God. Father God, we just thank you for grace and mercy, Father God. We thank you for the Facebook family. We thank you for everybody that was tuned in tonight, Father God. Let us be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word, Father God. In Jesus' name, Father God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, just keep everybody safe as we go into these uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. In Jesus' name, Father God. Father God, I decree and declare Psalm 91 on each and every person. No evil shall befall us. Neither shall any plague, sickness, disease, or infirmity will come down our dwelling. No COVID-19. In Jesus' name, no, no, no Delta variant and no breakthrough case. In the name of Jesus, Father God. And we thank you for the word, Father God. In Jesus' name, we ask, Father God, that you dispatch angels on each and every person who tuned in tonight, Father God. In Jesus' name, Father God, uh, keep them safe, Father God. We decree and declare a hedge of protection over each and every person. In the name of Jesus, Father God. Father God, we plead the blood of Jesus over each and every person. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. In Jesus' name, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with y'all. Amen. All right, God bless you, and we will see you next time. We love you, Facebook, and we will definitely see you next time. So God bless you, and be safe. Amen. God bless you.